Hi, a very good evening to everybody. Uh, what I'm going to spend the next 10, 15 minutes is to take you through the brand's perspective of how we view influencer marketing um, and maybe share an example of how influencer marketing has been responsible for success for certain products that we've launched. Uh, I'll try to keep it as engaging as possible, so please bear with me. Uh, just to set a little context as to who we are as a brand, uh, so Plum uh, is our flagship brand. It's a 100% vegan brand and we operate in skin, hair and color cosmetics. We have a sub-brand called Body Lovin', which is a bath and body extension of uh, Plum. And then we have Fi, which is into male grooming. Uh, our brands are about spreading goodness uh, without costing the earth too much. And that's what we really believe uh, in what we stand for and we bring forward to our consumer base. The Body Lovin' is, brand is all about loving every inch. And that's the proposition that we bring about uh, with this category of products, which are much more fun. How influencer marketing really helps us in bringing forward all of this is something that I would want to take you through. Uh, these are a couple of values that we really, really stand for, and any marketing mix that we approach also is an extension of these values. Of course, customer delight. When we approach influencer marketing, we first solve for what's in for the consumer, rather than trying to do a hard sell about the product. And the previous panel also spoke uh, you know, very strongly about it. We let the, con the influencers create content. We really don't uh, compartmentalize it in very strong, uh, you know, briefs. There's an overarching brief that is shared with the influencers, but we give them all the leeway because they understand their audience better. Uh, of course, transparency, when it comes to our products, uh, when it comes to any communication, we do not hide anything. We are as black and white as it can get from an offering perspective. And that also helps on in building trust with the consumers. Uh, of course, we are all about spreading goodness. So through our content strategy, we also bring about good to the planet. Uh, we are partners with 1% for the planet, where a 1% share of our sales goes every year towards WWF. In the past, we were associated with saving the snow leopard. As of now, we are working with uh, beach cleanup drives with WWF as well. Uh, just a little context setting as to where we are, because I think this will give you a perspective of the strategy that then unfolds uh, when it comes to influencer marketing. Uh, we are a multi-channel brand. We are uh, amongst the top five skincare brands in different marketplaces. Uh, as far as our spread goes, we are in about 300 uh, towns, in over 300 assisted outlets, more than 15,000 unassisted outlets, we already have exclusive outlets which are 10 in number and every month we are adding one or two more doors. So that's as far as uh, you know the overall expanse of the brand uh, really goes. Of course, we're present in all top retailers, whether online and offline. I think what are the challenges that one is facing? And I can say that uh, with hand on heart for every brand and brand custodian that is there in this room today or outside, right? Uh, it's a very, very diverse consumer set that we are addressing. There is no one fixed solution that can serve the needs of every consumer. Uh, I think the linear funnel that really existed long time back, which was all about, you know, top of funnel awareness, consideration, and purchase doesn't really exist. I think it's morphed into more of a sphere where the consumer is bouncing within that sphere across all touch points, which makes the life even more harder for brands. Uh, of course, constant change uh, in consumer behavior, change in trends doesn't make our life any simpler at that. And to top it all, clutter, right? How many skincare brands today, uh, you know, in the market and one mushrooming in every corner of the country every now and then. So it just makes life even more tougher for brands like us. That, if that was not enough, I think these are all the parameters that even add more to the complexity of, for brands, right? There's language, there's skin type, there is age, gender, income level, exposure level, education level, understanding trends. I mean, I can go on and on. I'm sure we all collectively can add another 10, 15 to this, if not more. 
which brings to the point that there's not going to be a one set pattern that can work for every launch that you do or even across categories, what works for skin as a category may not work for color cosmetics, may not work for hair, right? So you need to come and uh, offer a distinct go-to market with each of these launches. So I'm just gonna take you through uh, one case study uh, which we're really proud of. And today the product that I'm showing you is the vitamin C serum. It is a number two across all marketplaces. And this is one product which has been built on the back of influencer marketing. Um, and just gonna take you through how we kind of followed this entire journey through in the last one year of its launch. Of course, when you launch a product, you want people to know, right? But this is a more nuanced product. It's not like selling a face wash which is a wash off product and you really don't need to hard sell it. When it comes to a serum category, there's more education that needs to be uh, imparted to the consumer, hence solving what's in for them rather than trying to solve for the brand as such. And again, a category which needs to be built on credibility. So while you would probably take, you know, the celebrity influencers to create, you know, awareness, but when it comes to credibility, efficacy, talking sense about ingredients, you really need to go to the specialist. And that's exactly the approach that we took. Uh, of course, target audience essentially was 18 to 35. Like I said, it's a very nuanced product. It's talking about 15% ethyl ascorbic. It's talking about mandarin. It's talking about a lot of ingredients, which even I'm sure a lot of people in this audience would find it hard to understand. So how do you really dumb it down and make it more approachable is the, you know, the way forward that we had to kind of solve for. Two big channels for us, uh, Instagram and uh, YouTube. While Instagram, the approach was very simple that we took care of very snackable content, which was uh, more friendly for the platform. But long form content on YouTube was hardcore education about what serums are. Uh, what is vitamin C? What is the ingredient? What is the benefit? How do you layer and pair with other products that are avail available in the market? So prime underlying factor through this influencer campaign was to create a lot of education content with the specialists. Uh, now, with every, any campaign that you're doing, you have to set aside what your key objective is and what the key communication parameter is going to be. Like I mentioned, we did not force fit, you know, that these are the five things that every influencer really needs to talk about. What we gave them was the ingredient understanding. What we told them was that you need to concentrate on what the end benefit of this product is, which was glow in this case. And of course, we tried to keep a color appeal so that there is more resilience and then more brand recall uh, with respect to this product. Uh, in terms of our content strategy, in terms of the format strategy rather, uh, for Instagrams, we all know reels really do well. We continue to do that. We also threw a lot of education carousal content through influencers. Uh, video stories where we wanted to track um, and, you know, have attributable traffic uh, through influencers. And of course, uh, every brand wants to do all of this for business at the end of the day. But that was not the key objective, right? Uh, I think a lot of brands fail when they try to use influencer marketing as, uh, or rather they keep sales as a KPI for influencer marketing. Uh, we at Plum do not uh, promote that at all. Yes, uh, if sales come, great. But the idea is not to take that as a primary KPI. That's always a secondary KPI when we approach influencer marketing. And YouTube, like I said, we talk about a lot of integrated videos and not standalone videos to drive further more credibility. We were absolutely fine when we were being compared to other products and other brands in the market. Uh, in terms of the overall mix, I think there are certain fundamentals that we really believe in and have you know, consistently proven uh, successful for us. Uh, one is long-term association with creative partners. I think it goes a long way in building credibility and specifically when you're talking about a skin-first brand, right? I mean, 
to ask a consumer to put an active-based serum requires the, con you know, the influencer to be really highly credible and be looked upon, right? You're not just going to get anybody, uh, you know, who can create content and has a follower base to be able to do that. So there is a very, very stringent uh, shortlisting process that we follow. We have a great in-house team. Of course, we work with a lot of agencies as well. But uh, the mandate for the team is to actually vet each and every influencer so that, you know, we understand the credible aspect of it. Of course, awareness and those metrics, their reach, followers, engagement, yes, those are hygiene. But beyond that, what kind of brands have they been associated with? What sort of content have they been able to create in this similar space? Um, so a lot of checks and balances that we keep in mind before shortlisting any particular influencer. Uh, for this particular campaign, uh, it was a great mix between macros and micros. And we did layer it up with about a 10% mix coming from celebrity influencers for instant eyeballs for this particular launch. Um, Besides this, uh, at Plum, we have a very active, almost 2,000 influencers uh, affiliate program, uh, which till today are running campaigns and creating content for us. And even through the affiliate program, till date, it's been more than a year of launch, vitamin C serum happens to be our highest seller. So I think one big learning is ongoing engagement, nurture, the content creators, make them grow with you. And I think that's where there is a win-win situation for both the brand as well as the content creator. Of course, uh, influencer marketing is never in isolation. So our entire social campaign, content, uh, um, all reach and frequency based campaigns had the similar messaging to reinforce uh, what the key communication was. Uh, these are the kind of content pieces on education that we were initiating with a lot of uh, content creators as well and on our social media handles, which is actually decoding uh, and making life simpler. I mean, skin uh, business in India is still evolving. Consumers are still evolving. There is no 100% understanding of what products are available. And I think if a brand can take the high ground of trying to educate and make life simpler, it goes a long way in generating and building customer loyalty. Just skimming through, like I said, we associated with a lot of celeb influencers uh, to get more and more eyeballs and instant awareness and talkability around it. Um, other key influencers were mostly beauty influencers. Going back to my you know, couple of slides that I was talking about, where there's education leading to credibility, right? Because th they have a loyal fan following. They swear by their recommendations, and that is exactly what we wanted to play along uh, with. Of course, once this was done, um, we had a new brand ambassador on board, and what we then did was, uh, you know, did a complete SOV campaign with YouTube on top 100 beauty influencers. Again, helping to further drive credibility and be seen at the right place, right? Because beauty content is being consumed on YouTube, so why not show and reinforce your advertising through these content influencers? Uh, just to summarize, right, I mean, we did all of this, but what did we gain out of it at the end of the day? What we gained out from an Instagram perspective was a very healthy CPV of 0.47, uh, which is great by any industry standards. Even when it comes to YouTube, we were at a CPV of 0.54. I think one point that I would really like to emphasize here is that for brands and agencies, the KPIs that you really gun for, I mean, you would not see sale here. Right? Sale is an end result when it comes to influencer marketing. But what's really, really critical is that your primary KPIs are very, very well defined. What did all of this, uh, you know, engaging with more than 600 influencers, 2,000 affiliates really result into? As on date, we are number two uh, on Amazon, just next to Garnier which is, of course, really pumping in a lot of money on top of mind, national television bursts, etc. The vitamin C campaign has never seen the face of television. 
Uh, it has only been supported in the last one year with extensive influencer marketing. And of course, you know, we've uh, coupled that with reach and frequency based advertising as well. And we are one of the best sellers in this category on Nika. So all of this really gives us the confidence that influencer marketing is here to stay and will deliver results if done right. And I think um, just the last slide that I want to take you through is what our learnings are as a brand, right? Uh, relevant content, please solve for the consumer first and then for the brand. I think it's extremely important. Attention span is not more than a second like we were discussing in the previous uh, you know, discourse as well. What's in for the consumer, solve for that. Understand the content creator and what they can bring on board rather than trying to you know, give them a checklist of things that you want to be spoken about only. Let the natural flair of that content creator be appreciated. Uh, consistency, I think for driving credibility, it's important that you work with similar sort of consumers or uh, influencers over a long period of time. It really helps build credibility. And we have seen results uh, you know, on a positive side, not just for this campaign, for multiple campaigns that we end up doing. Uh, vernacular mix, I think I just missed talking about it even during the campaign. Tier two, tier three, vernacular is here to stay. We've seen far better CPVs, far better engagement, far better ROI from a sale perspective, the moment we have a great mix of vernacular content. Again, give the consumer the language that they really want to be spoken to in. Do not force fit English as your primary medium of communication even while uh, creating content. Uh, keep an eye on trends. Um, I think I mean, I don't really need to elaborate much on this, but uh, what worked probably one year back may not be working for my you know, launch that I'm gonna do another three months down the line. So you need to continuously reinvent as a brand. And I think I've mentioned this enough, uh, look at the right KPIs. Uh, you know, the other day I was speaking to an upcoming uh, brand and uh, you know, the co-founder just mentioned to me that you know what, how do you measure your ROI? Uh, we are not seeing sales happening. We've used the best of the influencers, etc. But I think it's just the wrong primary KPI. It's okay to have it as a secondary KPI, but primary KPI needs to be more on engagement and views. And I think that really is the success story for a lot of brands who approach it this way rather than trying to get instant sales and then you know culling off influencers who've not been able to do that. That's about it from me. I hope I could just add two cents of our experience and add value to yours. Thank you so much.